So th this is a talk on, um, on positive psychology, or the psychology of what it means to be a little happier and experience one's life in a, in a more positive way. And it was very interesting, because I, I have a PhD from Stanford here and got the PhD in psychology. And, and, and I was struck during the whole time there about how is all I learned about was miserable people. <laughs> no, and I mean that. And I thought to myself, like, what the heck am I learning this for? And, and it's the other thing that was interesting is that uh, psychologists weren't themselves necessarily any happier. And, and I used to think to myself, well, if the stuff we're studying and researching like, doesn't work for us, then what are we doing? And what's interesting is there were a whole slew of people having that same thought maybe 20 years ago, that positive psychology was being ignored for a clinical model of treating what was thought of as mental illness. And while that's a wonderful use of psychology, it doesn't benefit most of us. It's, it's reasonably useless. And, and what, what was intriguing to me, and, and the questions that still are intriguing to me, is what have we learned that allow us to be happier than we have been? And, and how do we deal with real life in a way that allows us to be OK in it? And, and that's very different. See, it's very different than studying, like, what is it that makes somebody depressed? What is it that makes somebody anxious? How do we ameliorate depression? How do we help people become less anxious? That's, that's very different than what are the qualities that we can do? What are the things we can do ourselves? Or how do we relate to people in a way that the very practice of it is, is a success, is, is by its very practice, what are we doing that is it good for us? Is it good for the people around us? And, and in the last 20 years, a whole, a whole science has emerged around what works and what doesn't work, or what is it that allows people to be, health, to be happy? So the, the, the baseline finding is that, and this is so duh, it's, it's kind of funny, which I, uh, unfortunately, I believe that everything I say will be duh. That if you think about this, like, huh, of course. And you know, probably some older relative in your family already told you all these things, um, or some smart ass kid told you all these things. So the first, the first basic underlying tenet is happy people want to be happy. Now, I, I don't mean that just to trivialize it. It just happens to be true. Happy people wake up in the morning and say, what do I do to be happy? Less happy people wake up in the morning and say, what's on my list to do? Or less happy people wake up in the morning and complain about what's on their list to do. Or even less happy people think, I don't have the energy to make a list to tell me all the things that I have to do today. <laughs> and then other people say, huh, a list? But happier people, they wake up or they go to bed with some thought that they deserve to be happy. And that within that deserving to be happy, they will make decisions during their day that lead to happiness. So, but it has to start with some place inside that says, this is what I want. I want this. I want to be happier. I want to have a better life. If you don't want that, then you make decisions that give you other end products. So most of us, in a, in a culture of materialism like we have, we make decisions to get more money, more status, more achievement, more acclaim, more cars, more boats, more transportation, more vacations. Those are the underlying motivations of our culture. Happiness doesn't exist in those motivations. 
So you look at many cultures, and their basic things are antithetical to the people in their culture becoming happy. You have, it doesn't mean that there's not work to do to look for happiness, but happier people wake up and say something along the lines of, well, you know, I don't know how many days I'll have, but I want this one to be a good one. I want this one to have meaning. I want this one to have connection. I want this one to have purpose. I want to enjoy it. So that person might wake up and look at the refrigerator and say, wow, I have a filled refrigerator. What an amazing bounty. This is good. An unhappy person might wake up and say, oh, crap, I have to go to Whole Foods this morning. <laughs> right? So it's, it's not that the reality is different. It's that the motivation within the reality is different in happier versus less happy people. Somebody could say when they wake up in the morning, wow, I'm lucky. I have the resources and the skill and the energy and the physical capacity to go to Whole Foods and do nothing more than that to get my food. A crankier person might say, I have too much to do. A happy person might look at that refrigerator and think, how did I get this lucky to be among the tiny percentage of people on this earth who have no worries about food? How did I possibly get that lucky? What did I ever do? A happier person will look at that refrigerator and reflect about all the labor that went into getting that food there. Like how many thousands and thousands of people had to do their work for that food to show up and for the rest of us to look at it with absolutely no appreciation? None for most of us. So it starts at the beginning of the day with motivation. Like, what do you want? Like, what kind of day do you want? If you listen just to your culture, you'll have a day that's very pedestrian. You will. You'll have a day that is focused on simple things that people can do to not rock the boat, to not, not cause questions, to not examine assumptions, and to just do basically what you've been programmed to do as a member of a culture. Happier people take a little step away from the mainstream of their culture because they recognize that they actually have to decide for themselves a bit of what works, not just what the herd is doing, because the herd is generally not, well, not bad, it's just not thoughtful enough. So a happy person looking at a refrigerator thinks, wow, abundance, remarkable. A culturally trapped person might think that I need a better refrigerator that I don't have the fanciest one. I don't have the ones that you can look in and see. I don't have the ones with seven different temperature zones. I don't have the one that makes me Perrier coming out of the thing. I don't have the ones with the 14 different kinds of ice cubes. All useless, all misery making if you're not careful. One thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing will never make you happy. But looking at that refrigerator and thinking, wow, this is awesome. I mean, this is really awesome. Now, what else do I do to have a decent day? This, this, is, this is what happens with your basic motivation. Most people's basic motivation is to fit in with their culture and to not strike out on their own and not do the sacrifices that are required to be independent of mind. And, and some of the things about our culture that entertain the heck out of me, just in terms of what basic processes are, is I'm trying to remember the amount of cases of beer that are consumed by the United States. It's like 70 million, uh, some 700 million, or some unbelievable amount, which leads out to like dozens of cases per person per year. Okay? That's not going to be like that happy a culture. And, and there's nothing against beer. Our culture suggests that you walk into a car dealership 
And instead of thinking, I am unbelievably blessed to have transportation, I am unbelievably blessed to somehow be able to afford this. But we're told by the culture that we need to have the perfect transportation. Somehow it speaks something about us. So I need perfect leather seats and a seat that goes forward and backward and that has climate control 14 different ways. And if I don't have that, I'm missing something. And then we spend our time thinking about how we're going to get all these things and how we're going to get approval and how we're going to be powerful. All those are fine. They just don't lead to happiness. So though there's a very, very fundamental question we all have to address, which is what do we want? And are we willing to do the kind of thinking and experimentation that it takes to find out what makes us happy? Like if, if you wake up and you think, it's beautiful outside. It's hard to do on the East Coast right now, I would think. But you know, certainly here, it's no challenge. It's beautiful outside. That's a really nice thought to have in the morning. If you wake up next to somebody that you actually like, that's another nice thought to have in the morning. Thank you. This is wonderful. Those are the kind of thoughts that contribute to happiness. If you're at work and one of your coworkers is annoying, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you ignore all issues. That's not my point at all. But if one of your coworkers is slightly irritating or is in a bad mood and happiness is, in your, goal, is your goal, you'll let that go because you want to be happy. You don't need to be right. You don't need to argue with them. You don't need to, you don't need to do anything. But this takes a self-awareness and a certain responsibility for one's own day in life that most of us are not prepared to take. And, and some of this data is from all around the world. You know, they would go and um, like go to different communities all around the world, researchers, and they would ask in, you know, in the community, like, who's the happiest person in the community? And they got data from you know, many, many different kinds of communities. And then they went and interviewed these people who were happier. You know, and it could be somebody who lived in a little hut somewhere. And it was somebody else who did this and somebody in that. And they looked at what were the qualities that these people had in common. And again, the most primary one was that they made an intention to be happy. You don't realize the power of your mind. And, and if you look at where you put your attention all day, you'll learn what your intention is. You know, so if your attention is all the time on how much you have to get done, or all the things you worry about, or being, you know, all the social trivia that fills our world, then you'll recognize that this is what's important to me. You can unravel your values by noticing what you pay attention to. But the first quality that is critical for happiness is intention. The second is attention. So when you make an intention, which is this is what I want, then it needs to manifest about where you put your mind and what you do and what you pay attention to. So one of the great disconnects in our world now is we claim to give priority to relationships and then spend very little time with them or on them. So we don't actually value relationship. You know, you, you go to a hospital that advertises patient-centered care and you get one of those seven-minute medical appointments and you recognize they do not value patient-centered care. They can give you any slogan they want, but a seven-minute appointment, which is the average time that an American spends with, I think, a primary care doctor on a visit, um, that doesn't suggest a truthfulness between intention and outcome. 
so, so one of the things that requires some thinking for happiness is, like, what do I want? And is that in alignment with how I spend my day? Like, what do I want? And am I doing my day in a way that gives me a chance to get what I want? Now, if what you want, if what people want, because if they want a big house and a fancy car and a title, and that's what they're spending their day doing, then they're in alignment. They may not necessarily be happy because of it, but they're in alignment. They're not going to necessarily be miserable because of it. It's just that those attainments don't have that much to do with happiness in either direction. They're, they're kind of as irrelevant as like how many potted plants do you have in your house? You know, they're just not, they're not of critical importance. If you have no resources or minimal resources, you're going to be less happy. Once you have some resources, having a lot of resources adds very little to happiness. We all know that. You live here and you know that. You see the faces of the people in Silicon Valley and you recognize very quickly that money doesn't equal happiness. We're not gracious. A happy people do not drive the way we do. You can't. You can't, you can't have a, a gracious, joyful experience and give somebody the finger if they're going five miles below the speed limit. <laughs> you just can't do that. It's, it's impossible. You, owe, you have to be flooded with adrenaline to be that tense driving. You have to be in a hurry. And there's nothing wrong with being in a hurry. It's just that that doesn't make us happy. So this is one of those poster childs for money and power don't necessarily equal like, open-heartedness and goodwill and a kind of happy disposition. That, that in and of itself doesn't make it wrong. But the research is accumulating. You know, one of, one of the studies that's really interesting is, and some of the nascent thinking, is that money actually now, the more money you have, the less empathy you have. And empathy is so highly contributory to good relationships that once people have a certain amount of wealth, they forget that they need other people, and then they start to take everything for granted as if they accomplished it all. And so relationships become less important, which is actually hugely contributory to happiness. So some of the studies that are really interesting, and I think these come out of UC Berkeley, very simple studies where they'll, they had people do research by watching um, cars going past um, a crosswalk where people were crossing. And they wanted to see who stopped at the crosswalk to let people go by. And they saw a direct relationship between the expense of the car and the number of people who stopped at the crosswalk. And the more expensive the car, the less times they stopped, which is fascinating. Think of this one. This is the other one. That, that's data. The other data that I think that they talked about was that it turns out that people with means shoplift more than people without means. Do some interesting data. Other data is wealthy people, and many of you have seen this, contribute less of their income than very poor people to charity, which is fascinating, right? But here's one of the thoughts that, that got me thinking about wealth and happiness. Somebody shared this with me, and I thought it was just brilliant. I mean, brilliant, because it's so simple and so elegant. He said, Fred, you know, I go in and talk to my lawyer, who's charging me $350 an hour. If I take 10 more minutes of his time, I get a bill for 50 bucks, right? When I talk to people making $15 an hour, they're not charging me by the 10 minutes. What does that say about the human experience, that even with that much money, they're not generous? There's actually something shocking about that. 
that we all accept that and take that as normal, again, because greed is so central to almost every culture's perception of success. But just think that went through. You go see somebody who's well paid. They're fine financially. They, it's very hard to get them not to charge a very high amount for their time, even if you're in need. He was referring to somebody who comes in and cleans their house, who is charging maybe $20 an hour, $15 an hour. I don't know the amount. But he was saying, I pay this person to come in, I don't know, once a week, pay $150 a day. It's less than somebody else makes in an hour. If I ask that person to please stay an extra 10 or 15 minutes, or it takes them 10 or 15 minutes more to finish, I've never gotten a bill. Would never enter their mind. Now, that also may have to do with some self-perception of worth. So it's not so simple. But think about that. And just think about your life in terms of like, when do you have enough? And when can you be generous because you have enough? And then you're happy. The minute you recognize that you have enough, you're you're, you feel abundant, and so you can be generous. People earning $350 an hour who can't be generous, there's something very sad about that. There's very sad because, again, you know, we get a modest amount of time here. And our happiness depends in some large degree on whether we hold ourselves as coming from scarcity or abundance. Because if you're coming from scarcity, you're fighting all the time. Always a fight. I don't have enough. I have to grab more. I need more love. I need more possessions. I need more this. I need more that. I'm always like grabbing. Please, give me more. Take. I need. Take. Abundance says, I have enough. Thank you. I can now give. Most of the people I know are far into the abundance category. But they don't act like it. Most of the people that I know are way into abundance, way into abundance. But that's not their conversation, and that's not their behavior. However, when you feel abundant, you're happy. It's like, wow, life is great. When, when you feel like you have enough, and you can share, or you want to help other people, what a powerful statement that is. When you don't have enough, it's always about you. It's always about what can I get, and I don't have enough. And it's so hard, and life is such a struggle. So there's something very simple in there. There is. There's something simple that we have lost in our affluence, and in our possessions, and in our need for so much. We've lost that simple capacity to appreciate things, which is why income beyond a certain amount contributes very little to happiness, because it's the appreciation that makes you happy, not the income. It's an inner thing. It's like, yeah, it's in here. It's not in the house. It's not in the fine jewelry, or the cutlery, or the car, or the movie theater, or the whatever. It's not in that. It's in the appreciation, the thank you, and then even something more than that, like generous. Like, I have enough. So it's not a struggle all the time. Thank you. Thank you's a big start to happiness. Thank you. It's much of the way there for being happy. But if you wake up in the morning, you don't want to be happy. The normal human tendency is not to say thank you. It's to be on guard all the time for what can go wrong. That's the normal human tendency, is to be constantly on edge and worried and anxious about not having enough and looking for things that can go wrong and having very primitive neurological programming. Because our nervous system's primary purpose is to keep us alive not to make us happy. 
And so to say, I have enough, is a very difficult thing for a human being to do, just like it's very difficult for any animal. A lion very rarely says, I have enough. Human beings can stick money in the bank. You can even fill your whole basement up with cliff bars if you need to feel like you're not going to starve. We can do that, but our programming is as primitive as almost a slugs in terms of what it is that we look at to have enough. The, the, the quality that when we wake up and say, wow, I would like this to be a good day. I'd like that. Well, then you want to look for what you already have that's good. Not just what's undone, not just what isn't good, not just what needs attention, but what's good. What's beautiful? What, what's, what's there? And one of the simplest things you can do is think of someone who's been kind to you. When you wake up and you're anxious, think of someone who's kind. So I'm going to do that as a, just a practice with us for a moment. So I'd like you all to just close your eyes. We're going to do a very short visualization on simply saying thank you. So allow your eyes to close. And take a couple of slow breaths into and out of your belly. Slow breaths. And allow your belly to expand when you inhale. And allow it to contract when you exhale. And then picture in your mind someone who, in the last 48 hours, has been generous or kind to you. And generosity and kindness are easy to think about. Does anybody, has anybody done your laundry? Or listened to you when you needed an ear? Or helped you in some way at work? Or told you they cared for you? Or did something to be kind? And just picture that kindness and feel it. Feel the goodness of that kindness. Feel the goodness. And then say thank you from inside of you. Thank you. And then before we're done, notice that your heart is beating and that you're breathing and that your legs work and that you have a mind. And, and recognize at some level the temporary nature of that and see if you can be thankful for that too. That right here and right now, you're relatively healthy. Your body works. What a blessing. What a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. And then allow your eyes to open in a moment and just sit still. And just feel inside of you what it feels like to slow down for a moment and just see what's good.
So this is a happiness practice. It takes a minute. It's done by people who want it, who want the experience of feeling that their life is good. Now, you can do this whether your car is 10 years old or 2 years old. Right? You can do this whether you have 8 rooms in your house or 3. The size of the house has no impact on whether you can be looking for abundance. No, it's interesting. I had a friend one time tell me this, and, and I thought, what a poison culture we have. I remember I was on the phone with him about 15 years ago, and he was telling me that they were looking for a house to buy. And he was ambivalent because he really didn't want to take care of a house. Like, what do I want to, I don't want to mow the lawn, I don't want to fix things, and, but he felt pulled to get a house. Well, my kids won't grow up feeling happy and abundant. So I said to him, you know, I would guess that there's not one shred of evidence that your children growing up in that house are any happier than children growing up in Chicago or New York or Philadelphia or San Francisco where there are apartments. Like, just think about that. I try to, to use evidence, you know, like there are millions of kids growing up in apartments. They're not less happy. It's not like you wander around and go, oh, there's somebody from New York. From I can tell because they're less happy. <laughs> the absurdity of this is profound. I mean, just think about that. The simplest examination of that would show its speciousness, just stupidity. But we've all been brainwashed to think that we need so much for our kids to feel like stable and secure. That's ridiculous. You need a, a home, but more than a big home, kids need loving parents. Kids need stability. Kids need dependability. Kids need rules that they understand. Kids need parents who actually like each other. They don't need five extra rooms or three extra rooms or land. Now, this is not me being brilliant. This is just me asking the most obvious question. Can I recognize somebody's level of happiness by the size of the home they grew up in? That's an absurd question. But we've all been brainwashed to think that it makes some sense somehow. Or that somehow, like if we don't get to take a vacation to a fancy spot, like somehow our life isn't as rich. Like, that's also idiotic because there's no possibility that people who traveled 100 miles from home are less happy than those who fly all around the world. That's, that would be absurd. So we have all these fake needs that keep us from the true things that we actually benefit from. You know, your nervous system was hardwired to appreciate beauty. It doesn't have to be in France. I'm serious. It can be in Carmel, or it can be in Burlingame, or it can be anywhere. So you need beauty. You don't need a fancy trip to get to the beauty. I hope you get that, that, that the beauty is hardwired in as a good thing. The need to fly somewhere, that's all made up. I mean, it's not bad. It just doesn't contribute to happiness. It's wonderful. Fly anywhere you want. I'm not, but if we're looking to be happy, we'll look out the window first for beauty. And we won't complain about our lives because we can't take a trip somewhere, because that's creating unhappiness. These are all moment-to-moment -moment decisions we make depending on what we want. They're moment-to-moment -moment decisions. They're not, they're not big deals. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to do anything so deep. You just have to look out the window and say, wow, it's 
very, very pretty. I'm very lucky to be able to see it today. That's a happiness decision. But our brains need beauty. They, 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 they prosper in it. Our brains need other people. In fact, most of this, the front, is because it takes so much brain to connect with other human beings. That's the biggest part of our processing. That's the biggest part of our brain is people. Because we need them more than anything else. And so that's what being a human, that's the highest parts of our development, are to relate with other human beings. So when they do happiness research, yes, you have to want to be happy, right? But the thing that loads most on happiness is relationships, people. Do you like people? Do you like yourself? It has absolutely nothing to do with your job status or your title or the amount of money you have. Yes, you have to have a modest amount. But above that, do you like yourself is a much, much, much better question. And are you making yourself more likable to others? There's a wonderful question for your happiness. Are you making yourself more likable? Are you working on yourself so that it's easier for you to be in satisfying relationship? That would be a wonderful use of your time if you wanted to be happier, much more than putting in extra shifts to take another vacation or buy something better. Not even, they're not even in the same universe. It would be as useful to like fill up your bedroom with like dust as it would be to take another trip if you think that's going to make you happier. But people will make you happier. Appreciating people will make you happier. And particularly the people close to you. And defining yourself as responsible to be good to the people close to you will give you energy and guidance for happiness experiences. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? That's the, one of the best happiness questions you can ask yourself. Because that's abundance. You have enough. You're not grabbing every moment for yourself. I have enough. What can I do to help? What does a friend need? Simplest stuff. Can I, do they need dinner? You know, are they busy? Do they need some help with anything? Do they want to talk while they're driving? There's so many simple things. But when we think of what can we do to help, our whole body gets bathed in neurochemicals that we know is happiness because we're abundant. When we think of, I just don't have enough, and nobody loves me, and nobody pays attention to me, and what can I do to get more, you're not going to create as much happiness as you would hope. Now, do you just give? No. But you want to create relationships that are sustaining. You know, some of the data on mortality, that many of you have heard of this, is that loneliness and a lack of connection is a significant predictor of mortality. The simple question of, if you need help, excuse me, at 4 o'clock in the morning, do you have people you can call, is one of the great predictors of who's going to live in the next 10 or 20 years, much more than your blood pressure. There is so much to people. When you look at um, like what separates out the normal happy from the abundantly happy, it's usually people in relationships. And it doesn't mean that you can't be an introvert. I mean, you, you don't have to be somebody you know, going to dances every night. That would, that would kill me. Seriously, I, I don't know what I'd rather not do, like maybe pour cement or something, but I could not handle that. So if you're more of an introvert, you meet one-to-one -one with people. You limit the time frame. You know what I mean? You don't spend all day. You hang out for an hour. You make sure you keep in touch your way. But people will do much more for your happiness 
than any job title, not any, but most job titles, most achievements. You know, I, I can tell you the hollowness of awards and recognition. I mean, I, my work has been featured, I've been featured in the New York Times, and you know, PBS did a pledge drive video of my work, and you know, I'm sure there's an obituary for me in the New York Times, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, so what? God bless, but so what? And I got an award two years ago, wonderful, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the California Psychological Association. All good, but very little to happiness. Very, very, very little to happiness. Here's how you know how people are so important. When something good happens and you don't have anybody to share it with, it's not so good. Right? Well, everybody else feels the same. So you want to be somebody who makes other people feel that you appreciate their well-being and what good happens to them. That's a happiness practice. Find out what good is going on in other people's lives and listen and pay attention and give. Again, abundance. These are such simple things. That will make you happy because you will feel the vibration of another human being being heard and they will feel good. Okay, one more simple practice on happiness. I'm going to ask you to think of someone that you really like, some person that you really like, one person. And I'm going to make, ask you not to choose yourself. <laughs> it's got to be one other person. And I want you to think of someone you really like, and I want you to turn to the person next to you and describe their good qualities with no criticism at all for about two minutes which is almost impossible for most of us. Even the people we're married to, you know, my husband's a good guy, but, and then you get the list. Right? Doesn't clean the bathroom, he doesn't do this, he stays out late, he works too much, he watches too much sports. When I talk to him, he dozes off, he's on his phone too much, but he's a nice guy. That's our normal brain. It's always critical. You want to be happy? Praise people. Not stupid made-up stuff, real stuff. So I'd like you to think of one person that you really like and appreciate. And I'd like you to turn to somebody and describe their good qualities in detail. We very rarely use this profound intelligence of a brain and mouth to express goodness, very rarely. If, if there's people we don't like, we can talk about them for six years. <laughs> it's true. If there's somebody we like, we just take it for granted. So what I'd like you to do is describe like somebody's good qualities, what you appreciate about them, what you like about them, what you've learned from them, how they've helped you, what you admire, how you could pay them back, how you could pay it forward. A conversation around goodness with no criticism at all. And I'll call you back. Just both people talk for like a minute or two each, and I'll start you again in like three minutes. Thank you. You know, there, there are a handful of things that contribute to happiness. And, and, and you could, we can make this complex, or we can make it simple. Both have value. The simplest piece is some quality of appreciating what you already have. I mean, Al Albert Schweitzer said that. That happiness, I think, is wanting what you have. That's, that, there's something very powerful about that because it goes against all of our primitive, terrified conditioning of needing more and more and more and more because we're so unstable and so afraid. And as human beings, we recognize, like, I wouldn't say just the silliness, but the pointlessness 
of putting all of our attention on a body that's going to die. No, I mean that, that it's an unstable proposition, this constant attention to something that's impermanent. And so we're always worried. We're always worried that something's going to happen to us or somebody we love because something will. That's the truth. So we deal with it by trying to fortify ourselves. You know, if I get a big enough house and if I get enough possessions and I get enough money and I get enough status, then I'll be safe. But you're not safe. You're never going to be safe. It's just the truth. So there is this basic terror built in to the instability of focusing most of our attention on something that's impermanent and will pass. And so some of the things within that, if that's the truth that we can do, are very simple appreciations for the short-term things that nourish us. Because there's no long-term win. There is no long-term win. There's medium-term wins, there's short-term wins, but long-term, we all lose. And so if you accept that truth, which you don't have to accept it, it's just going to get you anyway. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you accept it, but it's there. Then you look for medium and short-term wins. You look for ways to be happier. Because you might as well spend your time with a little more smile, because you're going to worry a lot anyway. You're going to end up dead. So you might as well enjoy a little more of it. Because, you know, long term, we all know where it's going. So the appreciation is very powerful. Like just little thank yous. And particularly for other people who do kindnesses to you. Always say thank you. And look to be generous where you can, always. It's so simple. The other piece, again, there's, is people. Like, make sure you have some time for them. I think there was a study once, and this is hard for even me to believe, and I'm pretty cynical having read lots of research, that the average couple, married couple with children, there was one study that said that they spend an average of 27 minutes a week talking directly face to face to each other about things other than their children. That's, that's a low number. I'm, I don't know what to say of that, but that, that's not prioritizing. Now, human beings, again, with data, human beings are weird. So let me, I'm just going to tell you one study just to remind everybody how weird human beings are and how like we do anything to make ourselves look good. Um, in 1972, Richard Nixon defeated George McGovern in a landslide. I mean, just a landslide. And of course, that was my first election, and I was so for George McGovern. He was a li liberal. Anyway, Nixon won with about 61 or 2 or something percent of the vote. He, it was a big victory. I can't remember the exact amount. But Gallup did a survey. Maybe if the election was in November, six months later after the landslide, they just wanted to check. Like, how many people claim to have voted for the winner? I think it was like 75%. Nixon got impeached and had to resign in disgrace. So they gave the same organization, went around and polled. So how many people voted for, I think it was like 40% admitted that they voted for him. <laughs> this is us. <laughs> We're strange things. So within that craziness, which we all are, we have a capacity to, to, just to be nice when we can. So being appreciative and being nice, I mean, again, this is so simple. And the last piece that loads heavily for happiness is we need to have some purpose that's not just our self-gratification that there's a huge difference between pleasure and happiness. Pleasure doesn't contribute that much to happiness. And people who aim for pleasure turn out not to be that happy. Pleasure being short-term sensory stimulation, people who are 
deeply into the senses or all this stuff, if that's the primary measure of happiness, it doesn't work. There has to be other gratifications. So we need a purpose, which is sometimes nothing more than, look, I go to work, I sacrifice for my wife and kids. That's a purpose. Or when I'm at work, I try to be of help because I'm stuck here anyway. You know what I mean? If they could let me go home, that would be great. <laughs> and I'd be happy not to help another damn soul. But I'm stuck here, so I might as well help. But people who don't think that are much less happy at work. Again, abundance. I'm here anyway. I might as well help. So purpose, like what the heck are you doing? And for whom is a key piece of happiness. And again, you know, Viktor Frankl talked about you know those people who strive too hard just for happiness for themselves don't seem to reach it. That was his search for meaning. You need a deeper meaning, something generative, something for the community, something for somebody, and that makes all the difference. You know, if the, the old statement, if you give somebody a why, they'll figure out a how. And that's true, but in our culture, we've lost so much of the why. You know, we, it's just personal gratification and accumulation of wealth and resources and fancy dinners and travel, meaningless in terms of deeper purpose. And so the, those are the things that contribute to happiness. And those are the things that research have shown contribute to happiness, even though they're all at some level and in every one of the world's religions. But there, this is now, because of the 21st century, there's data. So if you're going to take anything from this talk that I'm giving you, it's like, you know, look for the little things that you can appreciate. Like the people in your life be pleasant to, and find some reason to like do something. I mean, I, I, I do mean this. Is, I told you this was going to be duh. <laughs> and I'm going to finish with there have been so many times I've taught like in the fanciest of places and you know with the biggest of titles and you know Fred Luskin from Stanford University and I've thought. A reasonable kindergarten teacher could have given this same talk to like little six-year-olds sitting on a mat somewhere, you know, you know, that's it. Be nice to each other and appreciate the food and let's say thank you and you know, clean up after yourself and we're here to learn and treat each other well. They got it. I'm real I'm 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 serious. I'm trying to end with that simplicity. That it's, you know, it is a lot, everything you needed to know you learned in kindergarten. And um, that's the, th that to me is the really good news of this. You don't need a Stanford PhD. You don't, you don't need anybody with any brilliance. You, you, you just, what we all need to do is slow down a little bit. Anyway, thank you very much.